Today we're going to talk about section 1.3, which is on linear functions, slope, and applications. So first of all, a function f of x is called linear if it can be written in the form f of x equals mx plus b, where m and b are just some numbers, constants here. If m is 0, f of x is called a constant function. So this is a special case of a linear function. On the other hand, if m equals 1 and b equals 0, f of x is called the identity function. So essentially what you have here is f of x just equals x. It's a function that does nothing. You give it an input, it gives you that same input back as an output. It's the do-nothing function, otherwise known as the identity function. So the graph of a linear function is a line. So this is why we call linear functions linear, because their graph is a line. The slope of this line is m. That same m that appears in the equation f of x equals mx plus b. So recall you'll have seen this before. The slope formula says the slope, m, is the rise divided by the run of the line. If you have points x1, y1, and x2, y2, which lie on the graph, then the slope formula says the slope is y2 minus y1, all divided by x2 minus x1. So as a couple special cases of linear functions, uh, let's talk about horizontal lines first. So horizontal lines have slope 0, and as a result have equations that are in the form y equals b. So m equals 0 here, in which case m times x equals 0. So mx plus b is just b. On the other hand, vertical lines have undefined slope. Essentially what you have here in the slope formula is a divide by 0 problem. As a result, we say that the slope of a vertical line is undefined. So vertical lines, uh, the graph of a vertical line is not a function. And as a result, vertical lines can never be written in function form f of x equals mx plus b. On the other hand, they do have equations in the form x equals some constant a. So let's take a look at a few examples uh, of graphing lines. So we want to graph the following lines. y equals minus 4 over 5x plus 1. And then in part 2 of this example, y equals 2 thirds x plus 2. So we'll go over to the uh, whiteboard app now to, to see these examples worked. In the first part of this example, we're asked to graph the line y equals minus 4 fifths x plus 1. So remember, anytime you want to graph a line, the easiest way to do that is to find any two distinct points on that line. And when you're given an equation of a line in the form y equals mx plus b, there's an especially easy way to do this. So in order to find my first point, I'm going to plug in x equals 0 here. And when you plug in 0, you'll get minus 4 fifths ze times 0, which is 0, plus 1, which is 1. So what that tells me is that the point 0, 1 lies on the graph. So I've taken the liberty to draw some axes here already with some tick marks already on them. Now remember, the convention is if you don't label your ax uh, the tick marks on your axes with units, you move up by one unit in every tick mark. So what we just found out is the point 0, 1 lies on the graph of this line, which is this point right here. In other words, this is the y-intercept of this line. For this reason, that number 1 is sometimes called the y-intercept. B is sometimes called the y-intercept. It's actually the y-coordinate of the y-intercept. So we plotted this point on the line. Now, the easiest way to find a second point that lies on this line is as follows. We're going to start from this point that we just drew here. And from there, we're going to rise negative 4 units, and then we're going to run 5 units. So I need another tick mark here on my positive x-axis. So from this point here, we're going to go down 1, 2, 3, 4 units. So we're down here at y equals minus 3. And then from there, we're going to run 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 units in the x direction, which means that our second point that lies on the graph is over here 
with x coordinate 5 and y coordinate negative 3. Now once you've drawn those two points, you lay down your straight edge or ruler and draw a line between those two points which I've graphed here in yellow. So at this point go ahead and pause the video and try to repeat the last part of this example to graph y equals two-thirds x plus two. When you're done, come on back and watch my solution. Once again, in this case, I've taken the liberty to draw a few axes with a few tick marks on it already. So first of all, if we plug in x equals zero, we get y equals two. So what that means is the y-intersect of this graph is at the point zero comma two, which I've graphed as a little blue dot here. Now, from this point, we're going to rise 2 and run 3. So we go from y equals 2 to y equals 4, and then we run over 3 units, so we get the point 3 comma 4, which is right there. So once again, at this point, once you have your two points that lie along a line, you drop your straight edge, and you draw a line between these two points, which I've drawn in yellow here. In the next example, we're asked to graph the lines y equals 2 thirds in part 1, and in part 2, x equals minus 2. So let's head over to the whiteboard app so we can graph these lines. We'll start off with part 1 of this example, which is to graph the line y equals 2 thirds. So you'll notice I've drawn my axes here, and in this case I've gone ahead and labeled two tick marks on my y-axis. One at one-thirds of a unit up, and one at two-thirds. Again, the convention is if you don't label them, they're one unit apiece, so we have to label these if we want each of these tick marks to be one-third of a unit. Y equals two-thirds is a horizontal line, that is a slope with line zero. So all we have to do here is find the point on the y-axis, y equals two-thirds, and if I could hit that actual point, it would be nice. And once we have that point, all we have to do is drop a horizontal line through it, which is right about here. So go ahead and pause the video at this point, come back, and we'll go through part two, which is to graph the line x equals minus two. So we saw in the last slide that any line that has an equation in the form x equals a constant is a vertical line with undefined slope. So what this means is we have a vertical line which goes through the point x equals minus 2, y equals 0, which is right here. So once we know that we have a vertical line, slope undefined, that goes through this point, we can just uh, lay down a straight edge and draw our line through that point, which in this case looks something like that yellow line that I've just drawn in. So you may have noticed that when you're driving on the freeway, sometimes when you're in the middle of like a, a hilly or a mountainous um, sort of terrain, you'll see signs that say something like a 6% grade. So grade is nothing but slope written as a percentage. So for example, a 6% grade is a slope of 0.06, which means 6 feet of vertical rise for every 100 feet of horizontal run which means you gain or lose six feet. In this case, if it's positive, you're gaining six feet for every 100 feet you go horizontally. So a common example of this that you'll see in sort of day-to-day -day applications is as uh, wheelchair ramps on various buildings or things like train stations, something like that. So for example, construction laws regarding access ramps for the disabled state that every vertical rise of one foot requires at least a horizontal run of 12 feet. What's the grade of such a ramp? So let's head over to the whiteboard app to solve this. So for this particular example, we have an access ramp that has to rise one foot for every 12 feet of horizontal run. So in order to find the grade, we find the slope. And in this case, the slope, which is rise over run, is one over 12 which if we write this as a decimal expansion is about equal to 0 0.083. So here the squiggly lines just mean that this is about equal. I've cut off the decimal expansion after three decimal places. So 0 0.083 is an 8.3% grade. In the next example, we want to find the slope and the y-intercept of the following lines. In part one, y equals minus 0.25x plus 0.08, and in part two, 
the equation that defines this line is 3x minus 6y plus 13 equals 0. So let's head to the whiteboard app to solve this example. In part one of this example, we're asked to find the slope and the y-intercept of the line defined by the equation y equals 0.25x plus 0 0.08. In this case, it's pretty easy to just read off the slope. The slope is this number here. So in this case, our slope is minus 0.25. Now to find the y-intercept, we want to read off this number here. But keep in mind that this is only the y-coordinate of the y-intercept. The y-intercept is itself a point. So in this case, the y-intercept is the point with x-coordinate 0 and y-coordinate 0 0.08. For part 2 of the example, we're given the equation of the line in the form 3x minus 6y plus 13 equals 0. It's not immediately obvious what the slope is in this case, but you can still find it very easily if you just solve for y in terms of x. So go ahead and pause the video at this point, and then come on back when you found the slope and the y-intercept, and I'll show you my solution. So the first step in this problem is to solve for y in terms of x. So to that end, I'm going to subtract 3x and 13 from both sides of this equation, and we end up with the equivalent equation minus 6y equals minus 3x minus 13. Then we're going to divide both sides by negative 6. This gives us the equivalent equation y equals minus 3 over 6x minus 13 over minus 6, which simplifies to 1 half x plus 13 over 6. So from here, it's straightforward to read off the slope and the y-intercept, respectively, of this line. In this case, the slope is 1 half and the y-intercept is the point 0, 13 over 6. The slope of a line can also be considered as an average rate of change. So anytime you're asked to find the average rate of change between two points on, say, uh, some, some data on a graph or something like that, just find the slope of the line that connects those two points. The example that we're going to see of average rate of change is in the book. So this is page 104 in the book. And we're going to look at exercise number 44, which is on consumption of, the, of broccoli in the United States. So the statement of the problem is as follows. The U.S. annual per capita consumption of broccoli was 3.1 pounds in 1990. By, two point, uh, by 2007, this amount had risen to 5.5 pounds. We want to find the average rate of change in consumption of broccoli per capita from 1990 to 2007. In our solution of this example, we're going to let T stand for the number of years since 1990. Now our job is to find two points that lie on the graph of this data. Our first point is going to have T coordinate 0, and that corresponds to 1990, with broccoli consumption being 3.1 pounds at that time. So this gives us the point 0, 3.1. Our second data point is uh, corresponds to the year 2007, which is 17 years since 1990. At that time, Americans consumed on average 5.5 pounds of, uh, per, uh, of broccoli per capita. So the average rate of change in this case is the slope between those two lines. And according to the slope formula, this is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And in this case, that works out to be about 0.141. So the interpretation of this result is the fact that, on average, Americans increase their per capita consumption of broccoli by 0.141 pounds each year between 1990 and 2007. The last example that we're going to take care of in this section is number 77 in the book, which is on page 106. So the problem statement reads as follows. Stephen buys a phone for $89 and signs up for a Verizon Nationwide Plus Mexico single line phone plan with 2,000 monthly anytime minutes. The plan costs $114.99 per month. Write an equation that can be used to determine the total cost, C of T, for operating this Verizon phone plan for T months. Then find the cost for 24 months, assuming that the number of minutes Stephen uses does not exceed 2,000 per month. So you'll notice here that they're giving us variables to work with. As a result, when we solve this problem, we don't have to worry about naming our variables in this particular case. 
So go ahead and pause the video at this point, see if you can solve this problem, and then come on back when you're done and I'll show you my solution. Now you'll notice that there's a lot of what we call red herrings in this problem. That is, numbers that appear that have nothing to do with the solution whatsoever. What we're really interested in this case is the cost, the total cost of this plan as a function of numbers, uh, number of months that have elapsed. So we start our cost function with the fixed cost, so to speak. The cost that Steven pays for his phone at Verizon, which we're told is $89. Notice this is independent of the amount of time that passes by. That's why it's called fixed cost. And then we have to add to that a variable cost. That is, uh, cost that's incurred each month and the amount total that we pay goes up every month we use the plan. We're told in this case that the uh, amount that Stephen play, pays every month for the plan is $114.99. So that's what I've written in here. We're adding the variable cost here. But it costs us this every month. After one month, we've paid $114.99. After T months, we've paid uh, $114.99 times T. So this is the cost function that we are after as a function of the number of months that have passed, which we're denoting here by T. In the second half of this problem, we're asked to find the total cost after 24 months have elapsed. So to this end, we plug T equals 24 into our function C of T. And what we get is 89 plus 114.99 times 24. You'll notice here that I've plugged in 24, and I'm always careful to put the number that I'm plugging in in parentheses, even if it's not necessary. I run this through my calculator, and I got $2,848.76. We now answer the question in the complete sentence as the total cost after 24 months is $2,848.76. That concludes the lecture for section 1.3. I'll see you back here for 1.4.